Today on YTV News, we give you tips on making that perfect March Madness bracket, we cook a tasty snack, and we recap our Mr. Wah event. And YTV News starts now. Good afternoon, Ween Academy. I'm Ty Abrams, and welcome to our sixth episode of the semester and our 30th of the year. Mr. Wan premiered this past Saturday, but if you didn't tune in, you can still watch it on the Ween Academy YouTube. Here's Rachel Codd to report on this year's winners. Your Mr. Ween Academy 2021 is... Mr. Wah is an annual fundraiser event widely looked forward to by students, faculty and staff, parents and family members alike. The money raised by the event was donated to the Kids Alive Foundation, where the school sponsors several kids from Haiti and the Dominican Republic. This was the first time Mr. Wah's audience was mainly people watching the live stream from home on YouTube, since in-person attendance had to be heavily limited. However, some tickets were available exclusively to seniors, and the first 80 to sign up were able to get a seat in the auditorium. The FAC was the fullest it had ever been in a little over a year. Each year, a group of senior boys compete for the title of Mr. Wheaton Academy in their own short act, usually through comedy, song, story, or a mix of all three. This year, the contestants were Tommy Reed, Evan Shelton, Jacob Williams, and Medeiros Zimagulov in solo acts, as well as Tyson Hogan and Jacob Tepe, David Stoner and Drew Ambler, and Matt Ellison and Connor Beatty in duo acts. The acts also consisted of some teacher cameos, including Mr. Royce, Mr. Falinski, and Mr. Mac, aka Mac Attack. After all of the performances, viewers texted in who they wanted to win, and the votes were quickly counted and announced at the very end of the show. Tyson and Tepe came in third place, Mandare came second, and David and Drew came in first place and were given the title of Mr. Wah 2021. From Wah TV News, I'm Rachel Cobb. Back to you at the desk. The boys are back! Thanks, Rachel, and congrats to all the guys who participated and everyone had a hand in making this great event come together. From one harmony to another, the Contaraya a cappella singing group is all about creating a unified sound. Catherine Yu has more. Contaraya is an a cappella club at Wa that uses only their voice to create songs and instrumental sounds. There are some really magical sounds and harmonies that can get created with a combination of voices. Not having instruments as a backup can be scary, but it also shows a lot of room for um, other things we can do with our own voices. This group of eight meets every Tuesday morning to practice. We're all committed to learning our parts and we all show up on time. And then we're just like laughing and singing from the entire length of the, of the practice. I ask a lot of them. I ask them to work out music on their own and make sure they learn the notes and come to practice prepared. It makes our rehearsals enjoyable because we're not just learning notes, we're creating music immediately. As Mr. Visker has said, Contouri is such a unique group. Being in a cappella is also special because it's in a smaller singing group and we need to depend on each other more. Contouri is very committed to learning music and like being able to express themselves through music. I really love the community aspects of it. We all share the same gifts and talents and we can use those to glorify God in the process. It is amazing to hear what they can do with only their voices. Let's look forward to their May 10th concert. And this is Catherine from Wa TV signing out. Thanks Catherine. We're definitely looking forward to that concert in May. Now it's time to take it to the kitchen and find out what our very own Chef Peter has in store for us this week. So the ingredients we're going to use today is just a half cup of Parmesan. Let's get into it. The first thing you're going to need to do is preheat your oven to 400 degrees. Grab a baking sheet and throw on some parchment paper. And then we're going to measure out a half cup of Parmesan. Once you have your half cup of Parmesan, just throw it on your parchment paper and spread it out into equal clumps. Once you have your parmesan into four equal clumps, wait for the oven to fully preheat to 400 degrees before you put it in. Once your oven is fully preheated to 400 degrees, throw your parmesan in the oven until golden brown. So once your crisps are done cooking, just take them out of the oven and let them cool for five to 10 minutes. A little longer than a few minutes later. 
after waiting a couple minutes to cool down, we got some great Parmesan crisps. They taste great. It took like 10 minutes. All in all, it would be a great after school snack. Thank you guys for watching. This has been Cooking with Peter. Let me know what you think I should make next week. Looks delicious, Peter. Thank you. For our weekly community scoop, I'll send it over to Mr. Thornton. Good afternoon, Wheaton Academy. Welcome to this week's edition of the Community Scoop on this fine Tuesday morning, the 122nd day of in-person learning this school year. I've got two quick announcements for you. First, because of revised guidelines released last week by the ISBE, we are now allowed to have larger groups of people gathered in a larger space, which means we're gonna start welcoming whole classes of students over to the chapel and the Fine Arts Center for our weekly chapel programming. Today, the seniors will be gathering, or the seniors, I should say, have gathered for chapel. And on Thursday, we're gonna welcome the juniors and just pay attention on, on campus or to announcements from Mrs. Fernandes as to when your class, sophomores, freshmen, will be welcomed over into the FAC for chapel. Uh, we're excited to begin expanding some of our gatherings indoors. There will still be distancing and mask guidelines in place for those gatherings, so there will be assigned seats when you walk in while we'll someone directing you on where to sit but it'll be good to start gathering as a corporate community for that time of worship and receiving God's word from a speaker. Second announcement, this one's coming from Miss Carwell. She sometimes sits in this seat for the weekly community scoop and she wanted to make sure that she gave a shout out and I'm gonna give a shout out to the girls basketball team, conference champions after this season. First time in 11 years the girls basketball team has accomplished that feat. So a big congratulations to the girls basketball team. And with that congratulations, I'm going to throw it back to the desk. Have a great day, Wheaton Academy. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. With March being Women's History Month, I took some time to give some research and find a little background to what this celebration is all about. Now that we have officially made it halfway through the month of March, it's important to still continue recognizing some notably important holidays, most importantly, Women's History Month. Women's History Month has its origins in Sonoma County of California during 1978. The event was a week-long celebration of women's history during the week of March 8th, primarily based in the, sound, in the town of Santa Rosa, California. Two years later, in 1980, the National Women's History Project was founded in that same town and began lobbying for Congress to officially establish Women's History Week as a national holiday. That same year, President Jimmy Carter issued a presidential proclamation designating the week of March 8th as Women's History Week. However, the holiday would grow to become Women's History Month when Congress declared March as its designated month for the holiday in 1987. This declaration led to subsequent resolutions by Congress between 1988 and 1994 to authorize future presidents to proclaim March as Women's History Month. Since 1994, every president has made this annual proclamation. The National Women's History Alliance, formerly known as the National Women's History Project, has chosen the theme each year. This year's theme is Valiant Women of the Vote, Refusing to be Silenced. You may have heard about the increase in vaccine availability or a third vaccine option made by Johnson & Johnson that requires only one shot. For more on this, Here's Tegan Allison. As the coronavirus vaccine continues to be distributed throughout the United States, more people have been given the opportunity to receive the vaccine as Illinois is currently in phase 1B+. This means that not only those over the age of 65, but also those with underlying conditions can receive the immunization. The new Johnson & Johnson vaccine has increased the efficiency of distribution because it is a single dose. President Biden has ordered 100 million Johnson & Johnson vaccines to be administered in the first half of 2021. This will hopefully provide enough doses for anyone choosing to receive the vaccine by the end of the year. Even though the shot is giving people a sense of hope for the end of the pandemic, it is important to stay vigilant and aware of the risk of contamination, even if you have received the vaccine. Studies have proven that you can still carry enough of the virus sp to spread it to others. As we all look forward to a future where we will not have to worry about masks and social distancing, make sure to keep up with the precautionary measures as we approach the end of the school year. With Watt TV, I'm Tegan Allison. Back to you at the desk. Thanks, Tegan. 
Yesterday's snowfall was a real surprise leading up to spring. For more on this week's forecast and to give you your football game day weather, here's Greta Gustafson. Thank you, Tyler. I'm Greta Gustafson, here to bring you your weather report. The storm front we saw yesterday that brought us some snow will continue bringing snow towards the east of us. It also brought us some rainstorms in the south, so let's continue keeping the south in our prayers as that storm also brought some destructive tornadoes. There are some smaller storm systems to the west that will bring us some rain on Wednesday and Thursday, but they'll clear up by Friday and Saturday to bring us some sunny weather. The high temperature for today is 47 degrees, which is right around average. The roads are still a little slippery and there should be some fog in the air today, so be careful when you're driving. But all of this will clear up by Friday and Saturday, so be sure to make your way to the football game. That's your weather report for today. Back to Tyler at the desk. Thank you, Greta. As an upperclassman, the opportunity to get off campus lunch presents plenty of options for what you can eat. So where do you go for lunch? Emma Vega gives us more. In the past, reporter Jaden Paulson made a segment called Can You Off Campus At? where they went to a lunch location and back before the bell rang. Today, I am standing in one of the many locations that you can, in fact, off campus. I went around asking students which lunch location they can off campus. Uh, the farthest place I traveled, probably Chipotle. It's like 10 minutes there, 10 minutes back. And then you order, so it's like another 10 minutes because they're short-staffed, and it's a whole process. Get to eat in class. It's always fun. Yeah, the, I think the farthest spot I've probably been to is, is about 10 minutes. I think it's the Culver's down 64. Okay, so I go to County Farm Bagels. It's about 1.5 miles away from school, and it's a really good place to get fruit off campus. I went to Chipotle, and we had about 15 minutes left. I normally go to Starbucks, which is about five minutes down 59, and it does not take very long if you do a mobile order. Uh, I've actually been starting to go to the Dollar General that's off of 59, um, and I love it. It's actually so convenient. Like, I could walk in there, and I actually bought, for $7, like, 48 Nature Valley bars. It was amazing. So, Wheaton Academy, now you have some new locations that you might want to try the next time you go off campus for lunch. From Watt TV News, I'm Emma Vega. Back to you at the desk. Last week, the Quiz Bowl team did something that has not happened at Watt since 1999. They won regionals. They beat both Glenbar North and Wheaton North by over 200 points in each game to capture the championship. Two players received individual conference recognition. Val Turdina, who ranked 10th in the MSC, and Daniel Titcomb, who ranked second in the conference. Congratulations to everyone on the Quiz Bowl team for a very successful year. For many students at Wheaton Academy, Summer Academy is a large part of their experience here. Registration has opened up. You can go find out what classes will be offered this summer at wheatonacademy.org slash summer dash academy. Many seniors will be leaving on Friday for their senior trip. The trip will feature a stay at Disney's Swan and Dolphin Hotel, a day at Universal, times of reflection and relaxation, and Mr. Thornton leading some vision talks to the seniors. Both our girls' and boys' basketball teams just finished up their month-long seasons. We want to shout out the girls' team for being named MSC Conference Champs of this year. Last week, the boys' soccer team played three games, winning one, tying one, and losing one. This week, our boys' football team plays its first game in over a year and a half. They play at home at 7:15 against Bishop Mack. And to stay on the topic of sports, Zach Gardner gives us a special report on making your March Madness brackets this year. What's up guys, I'm Zach Gardner and I'll be giving you guys your five tips you need to know for filling out your March Madness bracket this year. If you don't already know, March Madness is a yearly single elimination tournament which hosts 68 NCAA men's basketball teams. Each year, millions of people fill out a bracket and predict the outcomes of each game which is also known as bracketology. Even if you filled out a bracket or not, this video is for you, so let's get right into it. Tip number one is how to fill out your first two rounds. The first two rounds may look pretty stressful because you're going to have to predict 32 games, but I promise you it's not as bad as it looks. With how the score Scoring system works, predicting your whole first round correct and picking the correct championship team equals the same amount of points, so don't stress over the first round too much. There are numbers next to each team, this is known as their seedings. The higher the number, the worse the team, the lower the number, the better. In an ideal world, you'll probably pick the lower number seed to win in the game, right? Well, that's where upsets come in. And that leads us to tip number two, which is picking your upsets. Upsets are the core reason why perfect brackets are relevant and March Madness is so much fun. But how do you pick an upset? 
To start off, never pick a 16 seed to upset a 1 seed. The same goes for 15, 14, and 13 seeds. Can it happen? Yes, but it's very unlikely that you'll get them correct and it could hurt you in the long run. It's very high risk and medium reward. 12, 11, and 10 seed upsets are the ones you should be looking for. The best way to predict an upset is by looking for injuries in the roster, looking to see how many experienced seniors they have, looking at recent matches, and even looking at recent stats. You can also go online and search up analytics on the game, or you can just put the two mascots in the cage fight and see who would win. Moving on to tip number three, which is picking your Cinderella team. There's gonna be that one team that's too good to be true. It could be a 10 seed or a 12 seed that's beat top 25 teams, is stacked with seniors, maybe has won their last five games. This is gonna be your dark horse team that will go late into the bracket. Be personal and be bold with your Cinderella team. Even pick two that make the Sweet 16. Now on to tip number four, which is predicting your final four. Three years ago, there was an 11 seed in the final four, and two years ago, there was a three and five seed in the final four. So there really is no formula. In the last 35 years, 28 times, there's either one or two one seeds in the final four. After doing some research, I would pick the top two one seeds, maybe a two seed, and then a three or five seed, but it's all personal preference. And as much as the perfect four sounds great, it's not necessary to get first in your pool. You need to be more bold with your final four picks. If you go in a hundred man pool and you're looking at everyone else's team and everyone else has the same final four and you pick that final four, there's no way you're gonna get first. So you need to be more personal, pick different teams, have more variety that no one else has. And finally, moving on to tip number five, which is picking your championship team. You don't wanna pick the one seed that everyone's in love with. This is about winning your bracket, not fitting in. Find the overlooked one or two seeds that stacked with seniors have little to no injuries and have beat other one seeds. If you're confident enough and you pick a strong two seed that no one else has and they end up winning, that's 32 points. It could be the make or break of winning your pool. Be conservative with these picks, but once again, be bold. And those are the five tips that I have for you for filling out your March Madness bracket this year. Two years ago in the first two rounds, I only got one pick wrong. So hopefully that convinces you to take my advice. Do research, be confident, and most importantly, have fun. Go fill out your bracket and good luck. From Watch TV News, this has been Zach Gardner with your five bracketology tips. Back to you at the desk. Thanks, Zach. Guess we'll see how many people go with a hometown number one this year, the Fighting Illini of Illinois. Now for your four things you need to know, here's Isabel Kelsch. Thanks, Tyler. I'm Isabel, and I'm here to give you your four things you need to know. Number one, we went from eight birthdays last week to only one this week, but this person is one of Wheaton Academy's biggest celebrators. Wish Mr. Holtrap a happy birthday on Friday if you get a chance. Number two, Kevin Sampson spoke to us for chapel today, and for Thursday, we will be hearing from Mr. Visker. Number three, we have an off-campus learning day this Friday. Talk to your fifth through seventh period teachers about what learning will look like on that day. And number four, with a huge in-person and online audience on Saturday, the Project Leeds Global Fundraiser was a huge success. We want to thank the adults that helped on the show. Ms. Spittler, Mr. Holtrop, Mrs. Gregerson, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Bierick, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Rivera. Thanks, Isabel. That'll do it for this week's episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at TheRealWideTV. And of course, for all of us at Studio 22, have a great day.